We don't call it a riot. We call it an uprising because it was a collective response to oppression. One of the things that people need to keep in mind, and one of the reasons we call it a rebellion, is because this was happening all over the country. Many people don't know that between 1960 and 1972, there were more than 1,000 recorded urban civil disturbances or riots in the United States. In naming it that, you bring yourself closer to the reality that brought it into being. In, naming, in calling it a rebellion, See, if it's a riot, people think a riot's like after the basketball game, college, after the soccer game, Europe. You know, they think of some trivial reason. Understandable excitement. Red Sox fans waited 18 years for a trip back to the World Series. Go to the World Series! Some fans took the celebration too far. mischief in the streets and damaging property. I also condemn, in the harshest words possible, the actions of the punks last night who turned our city's victory into an opportunity for violence and mindless destruction. You know, but when you say rebellion, everybody knows that when you say rebellion, you're talking about something civic, something social, something really serious happened when you say rebellion. The shooting of 18-year-old Michael Brown has opened a wound in the community. The violence which erupted in the anger following a candlelight vigil has taken place in Ferguson, a suburban St. Louis. Because most people at some point in their own histories, you know, if you're Irish, you know about the Irish rebellion, <laughs> you know, if you American, you know about <laughs> American Revolution. It's only when you come to black people that the idea of people using force to change or to address their situation becomes taboo. Last night again in suburban St. Louis, the scene that photographers captured looked like a police state. Using the same tactical getup and the same weaponry we've come to expect in urban warfare in Iraq and Afghanistan, police in Ferguson, Missouri once again had to put down and head off violence in the streets following the shooting days ago of a young unarmed black man who was supposed to head off to college this week. Now in the American Revolution, all kind of force was used. People don't talk about human rights when they tarred and feathered Tories up, up there in West Orange here in New Jersey. You know, people don't call the Boston Tea Party a riot. That was a riot, you know. They, I mean, they dressed up like somebody else and went and destroyed the property, threw the tea overboard. But when black people, oh no, black people cannot bear arms. Look, when Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman and Thaddeus Stevens went to Abraham Lincoln and told him that he needed to put arms in the hands of the people who had the biggest vested interest in winning this civil war, he winced. <laughs> because what's the immediate thought? Well, we put guns in their hands, they're gonna get revenge for what, what we did to them for the past 200 years. Well, I don't think you can ever predict a riot, though, and Martin Luther King said a riot is the language of the unheard. I think we've got to see that a riot is the language of the unheard. Uh, it has a particular singularity and its distinctiveness that you've got a lot of oppressive conditions, you've got levels of social misery, but they can be in place for a while and there's still no riot. And what is it that America has failed to hear? Usually there's a particular moment where the righteous indignation spills over because people can just no longer take it. It's failed to hear that the economic plight of the Negro poor has worsened over the last few years. It could be a police killing a fellow citizen, it could be an act of viol an ugly act of a violation of respect of somebody. It's got to be something that's deeply psychic and it touches the spirit of a people. They reach the point where they actually engage in rebellion. How many summers like this one do you imagine that we can expect? Well, I would say this, we don't have long. The mood of the Negro community now is one of urgency, one of saying that we aren't gonna wait 
that we've got to have our freedom, we've waited too long. So that uh, I would say that every summer we are going to have this kind of vigorous protest. My hope is that it will be nonviolent. I would hope that we can avoid riots because riots are self-defeating and socially destructive. I would hope that we can avoid riots, but that we will be as militant and as determined next summer and through the winter uh, as we have been this summer. And I think the answer about how long it will take will depend on the federal government, on the city halls of our various cities, and on white America to a large extent. This is where we are at this point, and I think white America will determine how long it will be and which way we go in the future. In the last 40 or 50 years, though, it tends to have to do with the relations of everyday people with the raw violence of the nation state in the form of the police, in the form of police murder, police violence, police brutality. Uh, that's not the only one, but that tends to be the one. Now, of course, when Rodney King got beat up in L.A., that was major in 92. What most Americans saw when they watched Rodney King struck 56 times by white policemen, a jury saw different. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Lawrence M. Powell, not guilty of the crime of assault by force likely to produce great bodily injury and with a deadly weapon. And that had to do very much with police violence and police abuse. But there's something about the public display of raw violence on people, especially innocent people, where people reach the point they just can't take it any longer. There's got to be some kind of resistance that spills over beyond uh, legal means. There hasn't been a decade since 1967 when there wasn't an urban uprising somewhere in the United States of America. I mean, look at what happened after Rodney King in Los Angeles, in Cincinnati, in Florida, in Liberty City. You know, I mean, every decade there's been some uprising. I think that uh, massive oppression goes hand in hand with forms of resistance. And, uh, and riots oftentimes are forms of resistance and therefore they're unavoidable and inescapable. That they're always already there as possibilities. And as long as you have you know, um, economic exploitation, cultural degradation, uh, psychic put down, injury and assault on a chronic basis, you're gonna have riots and rebellions. hard for me to believe that in this day and age, 2014, so many years after Dr. Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement, we're seeing National Guard troops on the street to prevent this kind of violence in this day and age. It's something I didn't think we'd be seeing again. It would be interesting if the corporate media turned the cameras on the daily funerals of the young brothers and sisters who died before 18 years old. If they kept track of the dilapidated housing if they really went inside the school system, not first and foremost the prison system, they make big money on that, but the school system. A follow a young brother and sister trying to get a job, year in, year out, still unemployed. Get a job, underemployed, no trade union to protect them. Follow that and then make the connection between this one moment and this catalyst, police brutality, and then the righteous indignation. And then you say, put yourself in their shoes. How long would you remain? silent? How long would you remain complacent? How long would you remain contented? Put yourself in their space. Get out of your own egocentric predicament and conceive of the world through the lens of somebody else. Get your feet in somebody else's shoes for a while and you see what the world is like. 